Hello everyone, welcome to the chapter 12 video, which is all about approach chart analysis. So we got into this a little bit in the previous chapter. We were talking about approaches and understanding charts and how do they work. And this chapter, Rod likes to use as an example an ILS. Interesting story, by the way, I did look up the approach that he used as an example, and it has changed since he wrote this book. So now uh, that approach doesn't use marker beacons anymore. It's using some fixes that are based off of things like GPS and DME. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, something you might see actually more and more as time goes on. So anyway, I thought that what we could do is let's walk through a somewhat local ILS over in Wilkes-Barre and talk a little bit about how an ILS approach might be a little bit different from, say, a VOR approach. For one thing, this is a precision approach. VOR approach is not. And that's a huge difference right there. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll brief this approach. It's ILS or localizer to runway four at Wilkes-Barre Scranton International AVP. This is in Wilkes-Barre Scranton, Pennsylvania. It is based off of a localizer with DME, which is IAVP. So in general, the identifier is going to be I, and then it's going to have the same identifier as the airport. You might say, but what if there's more than one ILS? Okay, well, you can actually find the answer to that because guess what? There's an ILS to runway two too. And you'll notice that it has a slightly different identifier. So this is on 109.9, little tidbit. It's always gonna be an odd 10th for a localizer frequency. And it's channel 36 for the DME. The approach course will be 045, runway landing distance 7501, touchdown zone elevation 962, which is the same as the airport elevation. If I look in my next briefing area, I see that the T and the A, which tells me that departure procedures and or alternative takeoff minimums exist and there are alternate minimums for filing this as an alternate. Unlike some of the ones that we looked at in the previous video, it doesn't just say NA. So you can file Wilkes-Barre as an alternate based on this approach, which is not surprising. It's an ILS approach. It's going to get you down pretty far. All right. Some notes. Circling to runway 10, 28, not applicable at night. Circling not applicable or not authorized for cat C and D. Southeast of runway 422. So you can't be down here circling. You might say, well, why is that? Well, if you look, you're going to see some terrain off this direction. That's probably a big reason. Autopilot coupled approach NA below 2530. DME required. So you must have DME to fly this approach. And again, that's either actual DME or an IFR certified GPS. And you'll notice down here in the plan view, it says DME or radar required. You might say, what does that mean? Or radar. That doesn't mean that you have weather radar. That means you're under radar contact. And why is that important? That is important so that the controller can tell you essentially, hey, you've, you've missed this intersection or you're past this point, especially if you're doing the localizer only approach, right? If you're doing the, the full ILS, in theory, you should know approximately where you are. Well, I say if you're on the glide slope, you should know where you are, but that's assuming a lot. Okay, so back to this. It says DME required for in-op ALS, approach lighting system, increase the straight-in ILS-4 all cats visibility to RVR 5000, which is basically a mile. 
and straight in localizer for cat cd visibility to one and five eighths statute miles there is mauser lights medium intensity airport approach light system with rail lights missed approach climb to 3000 then climbing right turn to 4000 direct lvz vortac and hold next briefing section atis first thing i need 111.6 you might say i'm having a hard time dialing that in on my radio that's because it's a nav frequency that's the vortex frequency so that's how you get atis what if i don't have a vor well you're gonna to have to tell them you don't have a vor and you're gonna to have to get that some other way talk to wilkesbury approach control most of you probably already know these frequencies Wilkesbury Tower 120.1, ground control 121.9, or as they would say if you flew in there, contact ground 0.9er. Once again, uh, we are locking the little circle that's going to show us everything to scale. Someday I'm going to find an approach chart that has that, and I'll show it to you. Uh, when we start talking about GPS approaches in the next chapter, uh, we might see some of that. You have that to look forward to okay the plan view something that's different you see this feather this feather indicates a localizer the shaded part is on the right and you're saying well duh why wouldn't that always be true well remember there is something called a localizer back course where you might be able to fly say the other direction on a runway using this localizer it's not authorized here and in fact there is an ILS approach to both runway 4 and 22 so it would be kind of pointless but I have flown places where this was an available approach okay continuing with us we have our localizer here's the information also have the Wilkes-Barre VOR which is only pertinent if you have to go missed here's our approach path we're coming in 045 our procedure turn is once again a holding pattern pretty common heap is both our initial approach fix and an intermediate fix and it's telling you that this is 17.7 miles from the localizer so it's 17.7 dme on the localizer or if you're using the VOR instead then it's going to be 15.3 miles now if I look over here it's going to tell me a little bit more about that and how I can identify heap using this VOR it's a radial of 238 and a distance is 15.3 miles all right my minimum sector altitude is 4,000 feet around the localizer sorry around the VOR L V Z and what else is this going to tell us so dashed line missed approach we're going to climb to 3000 and then turn and climb up to 4000 go to this VOR there's the holding pattern I should fly at the VOR now I can go from the VOR to heap and I can fly that at 4,000 feet. That's what this is telling me right here. So I would fly in toward heap, and then I would do my holding pattern entry, turn around, and fly back in. Now, this approach is kind of interesting because there is a boatload of little intersections along the way. So I start at heap, then I go to JSAG, Zex's. Toyat and Fibar. If I go down here to my profile view, you'll notice in the profile view that I have a one minute holding pattern, which is pretty standard. I have to go outbound at or above 4,000, inbound, same story. Once I get to my fix there, 17.7 miles away at heap you'll notice it says radar so they can tell you when you get there or you can have dme i can start descending i can descend down to 3900 feet 
so a whopping 100 feet. And this lightning bolt, once again, tells me this is where I intercept my glide slope. So at this intersection, at 3900, I should get the glide slope. And you might say, why is there a Maltese cross here still? And that's in case I'm doing the localizer only approach. So this is another little minor point. If you are doing an ILS, your final approach fix is where you intercept the glide slope. If you are flying the localizer only approach, there is a final approach fix at a particular point, which will be identified with the Maltese cross. Then you'll notice that there are these step down fixes. Step down fixes only apply if you're doing the lo localizer only approach. If you're flying the full ILS, once you get here, you intercept the glide slope, you fly it down. You'll notice the glide slope is three degrees with a threshold crossing height of 56 feet. This is a standard glide slope. Okay, other things that are new. This little V here at 2.7 miles out, that is a visual descent point. What does that mean? That means that that is the point from which you could initiate a visual descent. Okay, well, fine. I'm not sure what that means, you might say. What that is telling you is that if you are at the MDA at that point, you should be able to make a, basically a normal descent and land. You're not going to have to do anything terribly heroic in order to get in there. Again, this is only applicable to the localizer only approach. And of course, all the distances are listed here. Missed approach point procedure, climb to 3,000, 4,000 as you turn right. Go to the VOR, hold there. ILS approach to runway four, gets you down to 1262, then RVR of 2400, and that is essentially 300 feet in the air because the touchdown zone elevation was 962, same as the airport elevation. What if you're doing a localizer only approach? Now you have higher minimums. What if you're circling to land on another runway? even higher minimums. The nice thing about it though, and notice that these minimums are all still lower than what you got back in bloom. So it's still a pretty good approach, even if you were circling to land on another runway. Over here we have our aerodrome sketch. It's showing you, sure enough, it's going to point you straight down runway four and the airport diagram. You'll see things like vazies and pappies the approach lighting system, couple of obstructions, the tower is here. It tells you high intensity runway lights on 422, medium intensity runway lights on 1028, rail runways 10, 22, and 28. So they have lots of nice lights there. And remember, you're allowed to descend an additional 100 feet if you have the lights in sight. And then you have to have the runway in sight in order to descend beyond that. So this will get you down to 300 feet in the air. You can see the lights. You can go to 200 feet in the air. And then, and only if you can see the actual runway, now you can go all the way down and land. That's the ILS into Wilkesbury. Some other things Rod talks about in this chapter. It says pretty much if you want to look at other kinds of approaches, they're going to be very similar. You know, he talks about things like LDAs. What's an LDA approach? Well, it's like a localizer, except it's not going to get you aligned perfectly with the runway for example. And he talks about uh, things like NDB approaches. You know, NDB approaches are not lots of fun, but you can do them. Well, I should say you could do them if you have equipment to do those, but a lot of us don't. Okay.
I don't want to really get into those other kinds of approaches just yet. Uh, that's something that we could possibly talk about later if there's interest. One of the things I definitely want to talk about is the is like alternate minimums. It says note special alternate minimums apply. All right, so let's see what that says. So this, if I bought my instrument approach plates, this would be at the front of it. Alternate airport minimums. If I scroll down here to Oaksbury Scranton, then I'll zoom in a little bit. ILS or localizer runway four, ILS or localizer runway two, two. Right, so there's a couple of notes here. The first one says ILS localizer category A, 902, category B, 1102, category C, 1103, category D, 1403. So that's what the weather has to be forecast to file this as an alternate minimum. You'll notice that we also have departure procedures. It has the Scranton 7 and it says that it's changed at some point. But this is a departure, a standard instrument departure, SID. What does that mean? If you're departing from Scranton, these are the ways they're normally going to expect you to depart. And off runway four, climb to heading of heading 044 to 5000 thence. Pretty much expect radar vectors to assign route, nav, aid, fix, and clearance to filed altitude flight level within 10 minutes after departure. Here they're showing you all of the different nav aids around. That is a standard instrument departure, the Scranton 7. Now, if you were going to file this as part of your flight plan, you would use AVP 7.AVP. It says special takeoff minimums departure procedures exist. Already told us that. It is once again takeoff minimums departure procedures. So I could look up this airport and see what those are. For that takeoff minimums don't apply to us for the most part, but departure procedures can. While I'm here. I can look at Bloomsburg. Takeoff minimums and obstacle departure procedures. Takeoff minimums, runway 9, standard with minimum climb of 660 feet per nautical mile, 1400 or 21.3 for climb in visual conditions. Runway 27, standard with minimum climb of 300 feet per nautical mile to 1400 or 1 3 for climb in visual conditions. Departure procedure, climb on runway 9, climbing left turn to heading 059 to 2200 before proceeding on course. Do not exceed 180 knots. Not a problem for many of us. Heading of 254 to 2200 if you go on 27 before proceeding on course. And there's some notes too. All right, what if I'm going to a big airport? Go to... Philadelphia. They have a lot of runways. Yep. Do they have a lot of approaches? Also, yep. Now they also have something new. They have stars. Standard terminal arrivals. I might be told, in fact, bunt two. Depending on which way I'm coming from, that might be kind of a standard thing to do. Right? So, what are these? They're standard ways to get you to the airport. Sometimes there are multiple ways that you can start on this path. So here we have the Johnstown transition and Phillipsburg transition. Phillipsburg, come in this way and start at Johnstown. And if I wanted to file this as part of my flight plan, I would say, all right, I'm going to do whatever I'm doing to get to one of these places. And then... I'm going to do the Johnstown transition so I can say JST dot bunts S2. Here's my textual description. Notice it says this star is for aircraft capable of 250 knots or greater. So probably not most of us. 
but that's an example of a star. What if you don't like SIDs and stars? You don't like standard instrument departures and standard terminal arrivals? You can put in your remarks no SID or no star and you won't have to fly them exactly but it might make life difficult for you and for everyone else. It's also possible if you say I don't want to fly this they will make you fly it anyway and just give you an explicit routing. Now the rules are that you don't have to have the fancy graphical picture but you do have to at least have the text for a SID or a star in order to fly it. That's SIDs and stars. Also talks about a contact approach. Contact approach basically means that you are going to kind of navigate your way to the airport and that you have enough visibility and you're familiar enough with the area that you can do it. Right? So you don't have to fly the full approach to do a contact approach. This is something that will never be offered to you. You have to ask for it. The visual approach, on the other hand, can be offered to you. In fact, if the weather's good, they'll tell you expect the visual approach. So if you're wanting to do an instrument approach for practice, you might have to actually tell them, hey, I want to do this approach. And if they're available, if they have the time, they'll let you. If the weather was bad, they probably wouldn't just give you a visual approach. But so that's something else that you should know. Just to show you how good you guys have it, I want to show you what an NDB approach looks like. An NDB approach into the Cherokee County Airport. Briefly, I, I did a lot of flight training here, and I briefly had a flight school at this airport. And here you have a really fun approach where you're having to use a non-directional beacon, which is your initial approach fix, and it's also, well, that's it. There is no final approach fix. You just fly out until you get a certain amount of time away and, and then you go missed if you can't see the airport. Right? And what makes this particular approach fun is a couple of things. Number one, there's 4.4 miles from that NDB to the airport. A lot of these NDB approaches, they're located at the airport. This one is not. So it's a little bit fun to do. Now, one other thing, though, I'd like to point out about this particular approach. This one actually has a procedure turn. So all of the other approaches that we've looked at today in this video, also in the preceding video, had a holding pattern reversal. So here you have an actual honest to goodness procedure turn. So how does that work? So a procedure turn, if you fly it the standard way, and you know Rod mentions, you can fly it a non-standard way, but why? I mean, you're not required to fly this exact heading, etc. But why would you complicate your life and fly something else? You are required to stay on this side of the line, however. So there is that. This is the protected area, and we talked about that in the last chapter, this whole idea of different levels of protection as you get closer and closer to the airport. Okay, so how would you fly this? You're flying the runway 5 approach. You're flying outbound away from the NDB, and you want to fly out for a little bit, maybe a minute or two, and then you're going to turn to a heading of 182. Then you're going to fly out for one minute. So you turned to the left 45 degrees. Fly for a minute, do your 180, which takes you a minute, and then you re-intercept this course and you fly it inbound. So what's the advantage of this procedure turn over the holding pattern reversal? it's a lot easier to get yourself lined up. Now, you'll notice 
whenever you're doing a procedure turn, there's always going to be a note. And typically it says something like this, remain within 10 nautical miles. They don't want you to fly too far out here. So this has a much larger area though that has to be protected. So one of the reasons that you might see a holding pattern instead of this procedure turn is there's some terrain or other things out here. But when there's a procedure turn, it can be nicer in terms of turning around and getting back on course. So that's an exercise that you might try maybe in a simulator where you fly to a fix, procedure turn, turn around, track in, track out. You know, in one of the simulator assignment videos, I mentioned something like this before and I said, but you didn't know what a procedure turn was. Well, now you do. Another kind of somewhat unusual, but not completely non-existent approach that you might see is the teardrop procedure turn. You might say, well, what is that? Rod gives you an example of one of those. This is figure 22 in the chapter, but it's an approach to DHN. It's the ILS runway 32. And you might say, well, how does that work? So here's this weird procedure turn where you come and you go to this VOR, wire grass, and you fly out on the 155, and then you make this little turnaround, and you come back in on the localizer. So you might see things like that, and notice it's right here on your approach. It says Vortac 155, and you go out until you get to Wabuk, which is 10 miles away. And then you turn around and you fly back in. Right. Again, there's a lot of interesting things that you might see out there. Now, real quickly, something else that's on this particular approach is a DME arc. So you have this DME arc that is based off of the same white grass, or I'm sorry, wire grass, VOR, where you can start here on the 230 radial, intercept this at 10 DME, fly the arc around, and then come in and land, or you can start up here. You'll also notice up this way, if you come in on the DME arc, you have to be at 6,000 feet, whereas if you come in a little bit more to the south and to the east, you can be at only 2,600 feet. There must be some terrain or something up this way that's causing that to be a problem. Okay, how do you fly a DME arc? That one is actually kind of fun. We talked about turn 10, twist 10 before. Maybe at some point I'll do a little simulator assignment video on that. But the other thing I wanted to point out, when you're having an ILS or a localizer approach where there's a DME arc, you will find lead radials. So what's a lead radial? A lead radial is telling you, hey, when you get here, it's time to get off of this arc. So here it says lead radial is 140. If I'm coming this direction, once I get to the 140 radial, it's time to start intercepting the localizer and coming in. If I'm coming this direction, once I get to the 116 radial, it's time to do the same. You might say, why is that? Remember, the localizer is much more sensitive. So if you're coming in on a ILS or localizer approach, you need to start turning in sooner. If you waited all the way until you got to the 128 radial here, which is where the localizer at 10 DME 
is going to intercept, it's too late. Right? So that's 12 degrees too late either direction. And you, what would happen is if you waited until you got a little closer, you would go to turn in and you would overshoot and then you would be going back and forth and you'd have a heck of a time. Notice that this approach does have an outer marker. You can see OM. It's right here. It is the final approach fix if you're doing the localizer only approach. Notice there are a couple of asterisks after the ILS approach. And if you go up here, you'll see RVR 1800 authorized with use of flight director or autopilot or HUD to DA. I can go with a local, a lower RVR if I have that conditions met. All right, so that's pretty much chapter 12. So in the last couple of chapters, we covered, you know, how do we make approaches for our airports and our runways? Talked about that in kind of general terms. In the previous chapter, we walked you through a VOR approach. And then in this chapter, Rod used an example of an ILS, and so did we. And we also showed you a couple of other kinds of approaches. Again, I could have a 20-hour class on nothing but instrument approaches and approach plates, and we would still not even get close to covering all the possibilities that you can have for an instrument approach into an airport. So I hope you guys are enjoying and I will see you in our next video.